Hello, everyone. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Today's webinar is part of the ITS for Us program and is being presented by the NFTA Buffalo team. Today's webinar will focus on hybrid systems engineering or is part of the hybrid systems engineering series and will focus on the Buffalo all access approach. So the purpose of today's webinar is to present how the Buffalo all access team navigated and faced the challenges of developing a multi-system multimodal deployment while engaging with stakeholders and incorporating their needs and preferences. We will also have an opportunity to uh, do some Q&A once the presentation portion is over. So to kick us off today, we will hear from Alina Slotchenko, who is the ITS for us program manager with the Intelligent Transportation Systems Joint Program Office. Lena will provide a overview of the ITS for us program. Then we will hear from Robert Jones, who will discuss the Buffalo All Access Program. Jamie Harmon Burney will discuss stakeholder engagement and community collaboration. And then we will hear from Polly Okunyev, who will discuss the ITS for us Buffalo systems engineering approach for a complex system. Uh, again, as I mentioned previously, there will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of today's presentation portion. So for the webinar protocol today, just a quick overview, you may have noticed that we have kept all participant lines muted, and that is to avoid any background noise for our presenters. If you do have any questions during the session, please feel free to use the public chat log, which you will find on the lower right-hand part of your Adobe Connect screen. We will make every effort, our presenters will make every effort to address all questions that come through when we get to the Q&A portion. We'll also mention that this webinar is being recorded and a presentation, uh, the presentation material, so a copy of the presentation along with the recording from today's webinar will be posted to the ITS for Us program website. If you registered for today's webinar, you will receive a notification when those materials have been posting uh, for viewing. The last thing I will mention is today's webinar is being live captioned. If you would like or have a need for closed captioning, you should see an icon at the top uh, of your screen of the Adobe Connect screen that says CC. You will need to press that button to enable the live closed captioning. So with that, I will turn things over to Alina Slachenko to get us started. Alina? Thank you, Carlos. Can you hear me well? We can hear you. Yes, thank you. All right, great. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alina Slachenko, and I'm with USDOT Federal Highway Administration, ITS Joint Program Office. And as Carlos mentioned, I'm a program manager for the ITS for Underserved Program. I'm also lead for the NFTA team site that is going to present today. So let me give you a, a brief overview of the ITS for us program, and then I'll turn the uh, mic to our NFTA team. So ITS for us development program deployment program was launched in 2019 by the ITS Joint Program Office with support from the OSC Federal. Um, Highway Administration, and the FTA. This is a multimodal effort aimed at enabling communities to demonstrate integrated technology deployment, supporting independent and seamless travel for all users across all modes, regardless of location, income, or uh, disability. The overall goal of the program is to solve mobility challenges for all travelers with a specific focus on travelers that often face greater challenges in accessing essential services, including people with disabilities, older adults, low-income individuals, rural residents, veterans, and people who have limited English proficiency. The five main goals of the program are to score high impact integrated completed trip deployments nationwide. Um, this is the first goal. Um, aim, aim, 
that is aiming to assist transportation industry in tackling difficult challenges of providing complete trips for all travelers uh, nationwide by streamlining and expediting solution development through pilot deployment. High impact, replicable, integrated solutions developed by power deployments will reduce the cost of future deployments of this uh, very critical personal mobility enhancement. Second goal is to identify needs and challenges by population. Um, transportation challenges and needs of communities uh, are needed to be identified to support mobility options for all travelers, regardless of location, income, or disability. The third goal is to develop and deploy mobility solutions that meet user needs. Uh, this is the goal to support and encourage communities to take revolutionary steps to integrate advanced technologies, especially those that enable adaptive and assistive transportation technologies into the management and operations of the transportation network, um, including non-motorized modes. Engaging key partners within the federal government, the research community, stakeholder organizations, and private industry to support development of potential solutions for all travelers is also counted under this goal. The fourth goal is to quantify and evaluate the impact of the integration of these advanced technologies, strategies, and applications towards the improved safety and mobility for all travelers. Quantified impact supports communication of technology benefits to future decoyers and decision makers. And finally, the fifth goal is to determine which technologies uh, which strategies and applications, as well as institutional partnerships, demonstrate the most potential to address identified barriers to providing a complete trip to all travelers in a variety of communities and built environments. So um, the USDRT awarded four teams with phase two funding to support the design and testing of their project. Phase two is based on site phase one concept development. The four deployment sites include Georgia Department of Transportation, GDOT, Heart of Iowa Regional Transit, uh, Transit Agency, HERTA, University of Washington, UW, and Niagara Frontier Transportation Authority, NFTA, Buffalo. So here is an overview of the different phases of the program. As I previously mentioned, there is a one pre-deployment phase three deployment phases, and one post-deployment phase. First, I wanted to talk really quickly about the work we've done under the pre-deployment phase. During this phase, we've assembled a multimodal team from across USDOT and other federal agencies. We've defined program vision and mission and conducted seven webinars for potential applicants and awarded contracts. We design a structured space deployment approach to include a comprehensive planning space. Uh, we saw this as a critical step to have a robust planning space for this deployment. The teams had about 18 months to develop their plans for deployment, prepare their teams, uh, as well as secure funding so that public agencies who would be the ultimate owners of the system are ready to take on the deployment. During the planning phase, each site developed 14 plans to guide their design, test, evaluation, as well as the post-deployment operation. We completed the successful phase one, and on June uh, 21st, 2022, we kicked off the second phase, design and testing, where the four teams uh, uh, are developing their designs, as well as preparing for testing the, uh, these new technologies. In phase three, teams are expected to operate and evaluate their deployment. And again, a critical component of the program is that deployments are expected to sustain operations for at least five years after the program is completed. Um, so let me move and talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the program's fundamental elements. Some of the important organizing principles around which uh, we're building this program include, one, these are real world environmental deployments. That means that with the deploy when deployment period uh, ends, we expect successful technologies will remain in operation and serve uh, as replicable models for other candidate deployed. Two, multiple deployment sites were awarded, and each with their own unique needs, focus, and technology solutions. So the key element is to recognize is that these deployments need to address critical transportation challenges 
for populations in their community. The challenges and user needs identified are driving the selection of technology solutions for each um, deployment. Next, these deployments are also expected to be both large scale and multimodal. When we say large scale, that doesn't mean a certain geographic size, but rather means a measurable impact for the deployment. So sites will deploy multiple technologies and more integrated together as part of their overall deployment. So with that, I am going to give the uh, baton to Robert Jones, Buffalo All Access Concept Deployment Lead and Deputy Director for the Public Transit for NFTA. Rob, mic is yours. Thank you, Alina, for the overview. I really appreciate you setting the stage for this webinar. As Alina mentioned, I am Rob Jones. I'm the Deputy Director for Public Transit at NFTA here in Buffalo, New York. We are the public transit provider for a two-county region. As it relates to the project, I'm also the concept deployment lead, um, which means my role is to take the things that we say we're going to do and ensure that as a project team, we're able to enact those um, items successfully and have a successful project. I'll be providing here a program overview for our own project for a few slides before turning it over to Jamie. So first starting with, well, what are we actually trying to do here? Our deployment area includes the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus, or BNMC, along with three adjacent neighborhoods um, that touch that campus, including the Fruit Belt neighborhood, Matson Park just to the north, and Allentown directly to the west. The BNMC is a 120-acre medical campus that's located just north of our downtown central business district um, and really has kind of merged into kind of the north part of downtown here in Buffalo. The campus itself is about 9 million square feet, so a very large campus, and consists of about eight different member institutions and over 150 different private companies. Um, while it was founded in the early 2000s, the last 10 years have seen a real expansion of growth um, in terms of the amount of visitors to the campus. Uh, there are about 16,000 people who work or study on the campus each day um, to access medical facilities and research institutions, and more than 1.5 million visitors for healthcare and other service um, annually to the campus, which generates a high need of significant transportation demand um, for not only visitors but employees as well. Um, so we have a really good mix of individuals on the campus. Um, furthermore, the residential neighborhoods that surround the campus also have mixes of various uses, including entertainment uses and uh, recreation uses as well. And our deployment in the Buffalo area will look at integrating accessible trip planning with our current NFTA transit service through on-demand an on-demand shuttle. We'll also have indoor and outdoor wayfinding components of the project um, and be improving intersection technology through safety changes for our travelers um, throughout our unique platform. <clears throat> we really have four key elements to our project, and this slide is meant to um, represent how the system is designed to flow as kind of a feedback loop. The first element of the project is really our complete trip platform, which is a newly designed integrated trip planning function for travelers that is focused on information needs, um, along with special needs for travelers that incorporate important information relevant to people with disabilities. Um, like escalator elevator outages that affect trip planning and wayfinding or obstructions and um, sidewalk condition construction um, near an intersection or a building closure. Um, those will all be incorporated into that complete trip platform. The second element on the screen here for the flow from the trip platform is our flexible on-demand community shuttle offering service within the defined zones um, on campus as well as including a human-driven shuttle and the phasing in of a self-driven shuttle as well. We're also playing on infrastructure at specific intersections uh, that are on and adjacent to the campus and uh, improving the external wayfinding through that smart infrastructure along with internal wayfinding components and to help individuals who need additional help during the last 100 feet of their journey so that, that is supported through the smart infrastructure components of the complete trip platform as well. All of these pieces are then tied um, to a publicly available dashboard that measures and displays system performance which then feed back into our ability to make changes to the system um, moving forward so that we're constantly improving what we're trying to provide to our community. The slide I'm showing now highlights a couple of different new services that travelers will be able to access throughout the ITS for Buffalo All Access project. 
um, to get around. So I mentioned on the previous slide the smart infrastructure that we component for the flowchart. We'll also have transportation information hubs as a component to the smart infrastructure. There'll be two hubs through our project, each with their own kiosk to allow travelers another avenue to access these services if they don't have access to, say, a smartphone um, or a personal computer. We also have pedestrian actuation uh, technology built in through MyoVision um, to allow individuals who are approaching um, two different intersections within the campus um, <clears throat> to have signal actuation automatically detecting their presence. And also the indoor navigation composed of a mapping platform that will provide turn-by-turn -turn directions and real-time location system to identify a traveler's current location within two different facilities um, on and around the medical campus, including VIA and um, Collida. The community shuttle component will have the human-driven shuttle that will be operated by ourselves here at the NSTA. Additionally, we are working with an outside vendor um, on the self-driven shuttle service, or SDS, community-driven services. Uh, Adestec is a, a new partner for us here, looking at the automation of some of those services for us as well. <clears throat> Additionally, from an accessibility standpoint, um, the both our service and the self-driving service will be fully accessible. And I just want to kind of point out that both of those services will be accessible and have safety stewards on the self-driven shuttle for additional assistance for passengers as well. There's a lot of components of our project, obviously. Um, and as we move forward here with the, the schedule for those, we can see that there are a lot of different things that we're trying to do throughout this project. Um, we released our um, first component of the All Access app in April of, of 2023. Um, the second release, which went over on-demand reservations, um, the use of caregivers and turn-by-turn -turn directions was back in October of 2023. Uh, where we're at now is rapidly approaching our third release, which will feature a lot, focus on a lot of different components of the project, including indoor navigation, our call center, kiosk, the performance dashboard, um, and others. Moving forward, uh, we'll be looking to do beta testing for the full system this spring through early summer looking at a soft launch in the May-June timeframe uh, to prepare for our operational readiness demo. And then later in 2024, we'll be testing our self-driven shuttle um, through the vehicle delivery, um, figuring out how to incorporate that into the full service overall. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but the um, app flows are shown on the screen here. So. Obviously, there is a login function in terms of how this is taking shape, an account creation component, the ability to add um, a, a caregiver in there or an individual to um, be able to help assist with planning trips for another. Um, the really exciting part of the setup of the app is also our trip preferences there within the trip planning functions, which provide a lot of custom uh, navigation components in there. So. You may be someone who would like to know how to get from point A to point B with bike, or you may not, and you can select those um, preferred preferences in there. Um, you can also modify um, walking distance, uh, service animal, et cetera, and other factors of your profile uh, within the app that will dictate um, what the parameters that will be shown on the last slide that we're showing here in terms of your actual trip planning will be able to come up. And those will all be tied directly to your user profile and the preferences that you choose as a traveler. For our at-scale deployment, we intend to recruit 100 participants during the phase two part of our project, which we are in right now, to support development and testing, and around three, uh, 300 to 500 participants in the phase three component, which includes all of the participants also carried over from phase two. This is when we have our, our full implementation. On the indoor navigation side, we'll have around 100 devices to assist with wayfinding and navigation for travelers that are using the all-access app inside Buffalo General Hospital and VIA, which is Visually Impaired Advancement, which is an organization working with individuals uh, with visual impairments uh, adjacent to the medical campus and across from Summer Best Station. I mentioned before the two travel information hubs. Um, these are basically kiosks that we will have to provide greater access. For the pedestrian crossing component, we're also looking to install these pedestrian, pedestrian safety technologies at two different intersections within the deployment zone, which is occurring right now that we have a nice break in some decent weather, even though it is still winter. On the vehicle front, we'll have a maximum of three or four community shuttles that will 
consists of a combination of those self-driving human-driven shuttles. And lastly, um, when it comes to the online and offline platforms, we will have um, one all-access platform overall along with the dashboard that we are trying to integrate into all things that we are um, providing in order to collect data and provide feedback loops for ourselves. I know that was a lot of information, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie so he can discuss uh, community engagement as part of the project. Thank you and look forward to your questions and conversation. Thank you, Rob. Um, and thanks, everybody, again, for joining. Um, Rob, I'm having some connection issues. Do you mind advancing the slides for me? Will do. Slide. Great. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk, uh, take a few minutes to discuss our project team's approach to stakeholder and community engagement, how through our various networks and community partnerships, we have been able to focus on ensuring that the right people and the right stakeholder groups are at the table to help develop the concept, and how we have kept stakeholders involved throughout the process to make sure that the system is being designed and developed correctly and ultimately deployed correctly. To do so, it's important to take a step back and provide some background information on BNMC, NFTA, and UB, the three key local project team members who played a major role in the community engagement process to help highlight how our relationship structure with community stakeholders and our commitment to collaboration helped ensure this is a community supported and community driven project. Advance to the next slide, please. So what is BNMC? We are a not-for-profit corporation formed in 2002 to facilitate and manage the development of the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus. We are not a healthcare organization, but the medical campus has several healthcare and health research entities within its boundaries. Overall, there are more than 200 companies located on the medical campus across all types of industries, not just health and life sciences. We focus on working with anchor organizations and employers on the campus and other public and private sector partners to build sustainable infrastructure, to create an equitable entrepreneurial ecosystem for our community and to ensure convenient access to the many resources and destinations that exist on and around the medical campus. We have a strong focus on helping advance safe, affordable, accessible, and equitable transportation options for the diverse populations that live and work near us. Next slide, please. Our board of directors also has a unique structure. We are a member-based organization, and the major anchors on the campus have a seat on our board. This includes Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, the largest cancer research and treatment center in Western New York, Kaleida Health, which operates three major hospitals on the campus, Buffalo General Medical Center, Oshai Children's Hospital, and the Gates Vascular Institute, the University at Buffalo, which has its School of Medicine and multiple other facilities on the medical campus, Buffalo Hearing and Speech Center, which offers a wide range of services to children and adults with speech, hearing, communication, and specialized education needs, and Visually Impaired Advancement, or VIA, uh, Rob talked about that one, which is a rehabilitation and social services agency committed to people who are experiencing vision loss. VIA provides tools, education, rehabilitation, job training, job placement, and support for people of all ages. Our board also includes representatives from the two major neighborhoods adjacent, adjacent to the medical camp, the Allentown neighborhood and the Fruit Belt neighborhood. So together, the board helps make sure that the major players are working with one another on the development of the campus and that we are collectively working to leverage all of our resources to help improve the quality of life for our diverse group of constituents. Next slide, please. The operations and programmatic work BNMC does flows through collaborative committees where we bring in more partners and stakeholders who can help advance our collective goals. This includes a communications and marketing committee, a public safety committee that has representation from facility operators and various public safety agencies, including Buffalo Place, UB Police, and NFTA Police, a neighborhood engagement committee that focuses on relationship building with our surrounding neighborhoods, a district planning committee, and a transportation committee that has representation from our member organizations and public agencies, including NFTA, GBNRTC, and New York State Department of Transportation. The transportation committee played a very important role with this initiative as we already had strong relationships 
in an agreed upon direction to work together on initiatives that improve access to important quality of life destinations on and around the medical campus. Next slide, please. At the NFTA, there are two other major committees that help ensure diverse stakeholders have a seat at the table to help guide public transit decisions. This includes the NFTA Citizens Advisory Committee, which is a group of 24 volunteer members who meet with Metro management every two months to provide input on transit issues and initiatives, and who help facilitate public involvement by sharing information about surveys, events, and other participation opportunities within their community. And it includes the NFTA Accessibility Advisory Committee, which is an open to the public group that meets on a monthly basis to discuss accessibility issues and opportunities in the public transit system. These two groups have been actively involved in the Buffalo All Access Project as well. Next slide, please. At UB, there are two key groups who are involved in this project and that help shape our community engagement process. The first group is the UB Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access, or the IDEA Center. The IDEA Center is a globally recognized center of excellence committed to creating and implementing inclusive design strategies policies, practices, environments, and products. Through their work, the IDEA Center has strong existing relationships with members of the disability community and expertise in new and emerging accessibility technology. The second group comes out of the UB School of Engineering and Applied Sciences with academic leaders who have experience in intelligent transportation systems and connected and autonomous vehicles and strong relationships with vendors in these industries. Both of these groups also have direct connections to university students who have helped with the overall scope of the project and have been part of the outreach and engagement process. The other key component that UB has brought to the table in the community engagement process is the inst institutional review board's role in crafting recruitment requirements and ensuring the welfare and safety of future participants. Next slide, please. So together, BNMC, NFTA, UB, our existing relationships and understanding of shared goals to help create a more inclusive transportation system, the partnerships we all have with diverse stakeholders and the committees that we operate help provide us access to a large and diverse stakeholder group to move the Buffalo All Access Project forward. The stakeholder groups that became engaged in this project include surrounding neighborhood organizations like the Allentown Association and the Fruit Belt Coalition, affordable housing assistance organizations that work with and have direct connections with diverse populations that they serve, such as the organization Heart of the City Neighborhood, various organizations that provide support for and advocate for people with hearing impairments, vision impairments, and physical impairments, healthcare organizations, public officials, and additional public agencies that all contributed to the development of the project and that can play a role in its sustainability and replicability. Next slide, please. So what kind of stakeholder engagement activities are we doing? Our process focuses on five main types of activities. We are going to go into more detail later on this. So to summarize the general approach here, we created a list of all stakeholders that could have a vested interest in helping develop this project and ensure it works for their community. And we began having meetings with these stakeholders to generate ideas and get their feedback as the concept evolved and development of the project moved along. We also utilized our committee meetings and committee members to gather feedback on a monthly basis. All stakeholders were also invited to recurring system engineering walkthroughs, and stakeholders were invited to ongoing agile demos and review meetings to make sure that we are continuing to get it right as the project develops. The fifth activity that we focused on for community engagement is related to the upcoming deployments and the project's outreach and recruitment needs. While we continue to work with all stakeholder groups on helping spread the word about the project and connect us to potential participants, we recently entered into contract with five stakeholder groups that will be playing a direct role in project deployment and in helping engage and recruit potential project participants within the communities that the stakeholder groups directly serve. Next slide, please. The first group is Visually Impaired Advancement, or VIA, which provides services to the visually impaired community at their headquarters on the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus. A primary location to deploy indoor navigation will be at VIA for these reasons. VIA also operates the 211 Western New York Call Center, and we will be utilizing 211 as the call center support service for this initiative. Also, VIA employees, many of whom have visual impairments themselves, will be helping with beta testing of the system as part of the initiative's soft launch. 
Beta testing will include training, focus groups, and field testing of the various aspects of the deployment to help discover any errors or anomalies that need corrected. Uh, lastly, VIA will be helping directly with outreach and recruitment within the visually impaired population in Western New York. The second group is Buffalo Hearing and Speech Center, which works directly with people with hearing and speech impairments, including people who come to the medical campus on a regular basis for appointments, school, or other needs. Buffalo Hearing and Speech Center will be helping provide beta testing services through the lens of a person with hearing impairment, and they will also be supporting outreach and recruitment efforts specific to people with hearing and speech impairments. The third group is Fly to Health, which sees a diverse population come to their main hospital, the Buffalo General Medical Center, on a daily basis. Indoor navigation at Buffalo General will be tied into this project, and a project kiosk will also be deployed at the hospital. Clyde will also be participating in outreach and engagement efforts with their employees and visitors. The fourth group is Heart of the City Neighborhood, which is a not-for-profit community development corporation. Through their work, they've built a trust in relationships with diverse populations across the Western New York community, and will be helping with both beta testing and outreach and recruitment within the surrounding neighborhoods. And the fifth group, is the Fruit Belt Coalition, which is also known as Fruit of the City. The Fruit Belt Coalition is an advocacy organization focused on improving the quality of life of the Fruit Belt neighborhood and beyond. The coalition will be helping with beta testing and outreach and recruitment within the Fruit Belt neighborhood. So by bringing these five stakeholders together, our goal is to make sure that the, the deployment is servicing people that could benefit the most from it, and that there's a strong sense of trust within our community that encourages people to participate in its deployment. The soft launch is currently scheduled to take place in a couple of months, and the outreach and engagement team is currently refining and coordinating work plans on what engagement will look like. The team is also currently helping develop the type of promotional and language materials that would resonate the most with their constituents, and we anticipate ramping up community engagement in the coming months, which will include marketing campaigns, attending community meetings and holding tabling events, and much more. And with that, I will hand it over to Polly. Uh, Polly is with ICF and is the system engineering lead for the project. Hi, can you hear me? Um, I yep. guess so. Thanks. So thank you, Jamie. Um, I'll be talking about our hybrid approach. Um, due to the complexity of all the systems that we acquired, developed, and are integrating into the system, uh, we had to adjust our system engineering process to meet the needs of the subsystems and components um, and the way that we acquired them. Typically, a uh, system engineering process tries to engage uh, users to incorporate their needs and um, articulate or manifest their expectations into the development of the process through um, a uh, what is uh, called a, a V diagram um, and so we in uh, defining the in acquiring the the, uh, the system we had to take three major approaches to acquiring integrating and deploying all the subsystems and components of the project uh, the first is a software development approach uh, to develop all the all access app or the uh, complete trip platform app the performance measurement dashboard and to integrate the traveler features into the app that's the indoor navigation the uh, pedex and the pedestrian actuation request and the um, um, the kiosk um, we that we the the software development approach uh, we used an agile approach, uh, which I'll get into and describe in a later slide. Uh, we also used a turnkey system to acquire the, or procurement to acquire the self-driving shuttle, where the vendor builds, operates, and maintains the system. Here, the validation and verification uh, of the uh, self-driving shuttle will use performance testing to measure the successful deployment by verifying performance against the requirements. Uh, finally, we uh, procured off-the-shelf tools uh, and systems uh, for the integration elements. This included the pedestrian crossing request, 
um, the indoor navigation system and the transportation information hub, which is the kiosk. These components are scheduled to be, so the, um, the equipment was procured. There's um, off-the-shelf tools that we use uh, that uh, don't require any kind of development, but they, they also include interfaces which do require integration into the All Access app. Um, so these are the, these created a very complex system which couldn't be um, uh, applied directly to the system engineering process. Um, and so let me just go and describe the system engineering process uh, in a little uh, detail. So the system engineering process, or this V diagram, uh, which depicts the system engineering process, was used to guide our development and deployment of all three types of acquisition processes. We started at the top uh, most uh, left box in the V diagram. The system engineering starts with documenting stakeholder expectations on, uh, in the concept of operation. Um, we uh, then tracking these expectations to what the system does uh, through the system requirements development process. Um, then designing how the system will implement the functions and performance in the system design document and then coding uh, the software, if there's software development, configuring uh, equipment and installing that, those equipment. And then to ensure that the system operates correctly and meets user expectations, testing is performed. The testing is depicted on the right side of the V starting from the bottom and going up. But I will, um, so tests include testing each element, unit test Unit and integration testing is compared against the system design. You see the arrow from the system design to the unit and integration test. Verifying that the system does what is expected, um, which is verified against the system requirements, and it also that it also meets stakeholder expectations, which is validated against user needs and expectations. And to do this, there is um, a, a, after each one of these stages, there is a pause to review the documentation or the, the uh, descriptions of each one of these boxes um, with stakeholders. We've been fortunate given um, the uh, strong stakeholder uh, communities from BNMC, University of Buffalo, University at Buffalo, and NFTA to uh, have a robust, uh, comprehensive, um, diverse group of stakeholders that we've been able to engage in each one of these uh, stages. Um, but not all of the uh, procurements and acquisitions have each one of these stages. And so, I'm going to go through how, of the three uh, types of acquisitions, development, and deployments we have, how we adjusted the system engineering process to meet the, the needs of those. First is the turnkey system, which we use for the self-driving shuttle. Uh, and it only includes a subset of the system engineering process. The design, build, and subset subsystem testing are internal to the vendor product um, and they're proprietary. So as the procuring entity, we are only privy to the verification of the requirements of those performance uh, specifications that we included in the system requirements. And that is to ensure the system operates within the performance specifications without fault or omission and the system works as expected. For the component and system integration or the off-the-shelf tools that we uh, procured, the uh, off-the-shelf components, internal designs are also proprietary, but the integration design is developed through the agile process. 
Um, and so that is the next, the software development process that I'll talk about next. In addition, integration testing is performed to test the components interact directly with the system in this uh, case with the all access app. And so you can see we still have the system design that covers the interfaces and we have the integration testing um, which covers the integration into the app. But both of those are folded into the, um, um, the all access app development process. Um, we used uh, for the software development process for the all access app, we used a, a typical agile uh, process um, as a deployment activity The agile process more closely aligns with the system engineering stages that you saw in the V diagram, um, but is more transparent even than what we have, what a system engineering process would be because we pause not only at the major products that we developed, like the design document, but also um, in chunks when we get to a release. And I'll go through how the system engineering process um, works. So it, a typical system engineering process um, has a planning stage, which is kind of a reorganized uh, um, way of developing concepts of operations and system requirements, but it's, it's cut into pieces that can be cataloged as big chunks of, or epics um, and then detailed as user stories or um, how, this is, how users interact with the system. Uh, the process then gather, gathers these epics and user stories into what is called a product backlog, which will then be subject to more detailed uh, design tasks. So um, that design task includes what's called grooming user stories, which is uh, detailing them in more uh, 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 details, um, in more descriptive uh, languages, uh, uh, including reviewing the uh, user interfaces and discussing how the user expects to behave uh, with the, uh, the implementation. It's used to clarify the user experience and flesh out the design. Um, then um, uh, then it's, it's uh, each, once those pieces have been groomed, it goes into a sprint backlog, um, which is scheduled for three week uh, periods that cover either design tickets or coding tickets. Uh, the coding tickets include coding, unit testing, and merging the code. So you can see how it corresponds to the system engineering process. Um, and finally, once developed, once developed, the results are demonstrated to the product owner to ensure that it meets the customer expectations. So when we merge this in with the system engineering approach, um, you can see that the planning activities are correspond to the concepts of operations and the system requirements. The, um, because the Agile process includes tickets for design and coding, the design uh, tickets are used to document the system design. The coding tickets um, replicate the, um, the software development, unit testing, and what we call merge testing to integrate those pieces that are developed into the big code base um, and uh, also to test it that the system operates without fault or omission. Additionally, accepting, acceptance testing or operational readiness testing is conducted to validate that the system meets uh, customer needs and expectations, just like the larger uh, system engineering process does. Um, so 
what we have is uh, a stakeholder engagement. So we pull in the best of the uh, engagement from the system engineering process where each, where the, the uh, we have a needs and concepts uh, walk through uh, to review the project concept and definition. Um, we review what the system should do through that system requirements walkthrough. Um, we have, a, you can see over there on the left, how the system should perform through the system design walkthrough, uh, which is hidden. We still uh, uh, pull together and aggregate all the design elements um, in order to uh, document and pull and publish um, the design of the, the software. Um, during the Agile process, we also hold uh, meetings and demonstrations, um, which are typical parts of the Agile process. Uh, we use that to engage the stakeholders during the process to ask them if we are getting what they expected. So we don't wait until the end to do that. We do that throughout the process. Um, we've had two or three stakeholder meetings to discuss notification types and frequencies, as well as enhanced accessibility features. We'll hold another soon with the call center to ensure we meet their expectations related to how call center agents will interact with the app to help travelers. That will be part of the training session. We've held two stakeholder demonstrations to review our progress in developing the system and have gotten some great feedback from our stakeholders. We'll have two more uh, scheduled for April and June. The April demo will be preceded by conducting uh, comprehensive testing. Um, so it'll be sometime uh, near the end of April um, to uh, get feedback on uh, kind of a full system uh, development. We won't have everything fully developed by that time uh, because the self-driving shuttle is pushed out, but we'll have mostly everything except for handling of the self-driving shuttle. And as Rob mentioned earlier, the third release is due in early April. We have most of the functions ready at this time. At that time, the fourth release will be uh, cleanup uh, to address any concerns and additional security safeguards. The beta testing and soft launch is expected, expected in early May after we've done uh, field testing. Uh, we plan to train the beta testers in how to operate the app and report anomalies, um, and we'll uh, solicit their feedback as well on how to improve the app. In addition, we'll solicit, um, we'll also so, uh, solicit input from beta testers on their experience so that we can improve the accessibility and the other features. Um, we'll hold additional demonstrations after delivery and testing of the self-driving shuttle. The system should be fully deployed, verified, and validated by the end of the year. And, um, at this point, I'd, uh, since this is a public forum, we've been blessed to have a great set of stakeholders who have provided input and lots of insight into how to improve this app. Um, let me plug the, uh, the next webinar we're gonna give in April. It'll be a demonstration and a description of the app itself, so please uh, look forward to uh, coming to see that uh, uh, webinar. And with that, I will just uh, thank you all for joining and we'll turn this over for Carlos to take over for questions and answers. Great, thank you very much, Polly. And thank you to the entire NFTA team for um, that very informative presentation. As Polly mentioned, we have now entered the Q&A portion of today's presentation. So I would like to just give a reminder to our participants that if you do have any questions to provide for the NFTA team, 
please feel free to provide those in the public chat log and our presenters will make every effort to address all the questions that come in. We have received uh, a couple of questions uh, directly. Um, and so we'll go into those first and allow folks to provide any additional questions in the chat. But the, the first question we received is, um, how will you choose the beta testers? I don't know, Jamie, can you, uh, are you on? Um, well, I'll uh, take over until he could um, get on. Um, so beta testers um, are, need to be paid because of um, the uh, privacy issues and, um, and informed consent. Uh, so we don't want to use uh, volunteers for that. Um, I think Jamie can probably explain it uh, better than I can. And so that is one of the reasons we engage the community uh, groups to support us here. Um, we expect about uh, 10 or 15 beta testers from um, among all the five or six groups that we've, uh, uh, we're working with, and they will be volunteers from the organization. We already have um, some volunteers uh, who, from a diverse group of, um, of people with different uh, uh, accessibility needs, and so that's uh, how we expect them to uh, um, be come part of this. Thank you, Polly. Jamie, I, I believe you might have been in the process of trying to reconnect. Um, so I'm not sure if, uh, if your audio will work uh, right now. But um, if you have anything to add, please feel free to chime in. Thank you. I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, I'm not, I, I missed what Polly said, um, but I, yeah, I can just be really quick on it. The, we just wanted to keep beta testing in-house, so it's groups that we have agreements with, so that includes just our, our project team, and then I think I, I heard Polly mm -hmm. talking about the outreach um, partners are going to help with the beta testing. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Polly, as well, for addressing that question. So the next question we received was, how active is the participation of the stakeholders? Uh, I'm sorry, Nail. I think we're getting a little feedback from your end. Um, so how active is the participation of the stakeholders in the systems engineering process? Um, I'll answer that question, Mrs. Polly. Um, we have um, several dozen uh, participants for every, um, for the walkthrough, we had quite a few more actually um, for the concepts of operations and the system requirements walkthroughs. Um, we had about uh, 40 people or so for the design walkthrough when we hold the demonstrations We've had um, a few dozen people who uh, come to the meetings um, and contribute to reviewing this. We've had in the meetings we have for uh, where we ask about um, how we should implement something like notifications, the type and frequency, um, we've had um, a diverse group of people as well. That one focused a lot on the um, companion and traveler, um, so kind of like a dependent and and um, a caregiver relationship or a trusted companion type of relationship. Um, so we uh, received 
pretty good feedback. We asked about um, how people, what kind of enhanced uh, accessibility features uh, would be included. In some cases, we also uh, work with, um, with people one-on-one. -on -one. So for example, our um, representative from VIA, we've, uh, we've had some um, direct uh, relationship with them to look at and uh, uh, test our app for um, uh, text to, to voice. Um, and so we've had quite a few um, meetings and, and uh, quite an active participation among our stakeholders. Thank you, Polly. Um, so we did receive a message just now via the chat, uh, or a question, I should say. Uh, the question is, was there a specific decision-making process in the area that this deployment was focused in? For example, the Fruit Belt and Allentown areas versus East Buffalo or the Broadway Fillmore neighborhoods. Was the focus always the medical campus? I could take that one. Uh, yeah, this is Jamie. So the, the concept was um, basically around access to essential services and quality of life destinations as well. So it was tied into the surrounding neighborhoods around the medical campus, but a big part of this was around access to healthcare and job opportunities in the medical campus. The other piece of it too was we were looking at areas where there's public transit gaps when you think of the community shuttle and the surrounding neighborhoods um, don't have uh, as much fixed route transit access as other neighborhoods do. So part of the project was looking at how this community shuttle can act as a first mile, last mile public transit gap um, that services all the essential destinations on the medical campus, um, the job destinations, a few different types of grocery stores in the surrounding community. But those two reasons together were why this area was chosen as the, the pilot location. Thank you for explaining that, Jamie. That's helpful. Um, so the next question that we received asks, how will VIA operate the call center? What type of accommodations does the app provide? And this is Jamie again, I, I can uh, take that first part of it. Um, and that's a great question. So the, the benefit too of working with VIA is that they are the ones that currently operate 211 Western New York. So they already have a, an inclusive uh, call center already set up. So as part of our contract with them, um, the way this call center would work is that there would be a separate phone number um, that VIA will be the host of and will have a call tree. So certain types of requests, certain types of um, questions will go directly to the VIA 211 call center support staff, but also we're gonna have a shuttle operations center. So if there's questions related directly to shuttle issues or shuttle planning, it would go to the shuttle operations center. Um, but we're also just currently in the process and Polly, maybe you can talk a little bit more about it. And she had mentioned it though, of we're setting up that process right now with VIA um, through the, the engineering system on what that backend system is going to look for VIA to have access to the complete trip platform um, and what type of accessibility features it's, it's going to need to allow VIA to operate the call center. Yeah, so, so we're, um, they're going to be using a similar uh, front end as the customer does. Uh, some of the training that we're anticipating um, with them is to get them uh, uh, familiar with uh, the, both the mobile app as well as the, um, the web app, um, all the features. Um, there, many of the call, cent uh, call takers are, um, have visual challenges. So our enhanced uh, uh, accessibility features that we have should support them. Uh, we also have a uh, chat bot in there where they can 
speak to um, developing a trip plan and the uh, text to voice will help them provide the information to the customer, to the traveler as well, who calls them up. Um, so we're expecting that there's going to be quite a bit of uh, training and feedback that we get from them to help improve the, um, the services that are provided through the uh, call center. Great, thank you, Jamie and Polly for addressing that question. Um, I think we have maybe a couple more questions that we've received before we wrap up today's session. The next question is actually also related to the app, uh, and it is, are you including biking groups in the project? Will the app support bike trips? I can take that one as well. Um, so part of our, our stakeholder engagement process, uh, and you know, I'd mentioned that BNMC has a bunch of different committees. Some of the prominent bike advocacy organizations are at the table and we've, we have engaged them in the overall project, like Go Buffalo Niagara and Go Bike Buffalo. Um, there's no specific bicycle services that are incorporated into the complete trap platform, um, but the app does provide uh, bicycle trip planning and, and wayfinding. Thank you for clarifying that, Jamie. That's helpful. Uh, we did receive another question in the chat. Um, so this question says, apologies if I missed this discussion at some point during the presentation, but uh, is there any concern that the unpredictable and intense weather may impact the community shuttle services? This is Rob. I, I can probably answer that as the provider here at NFTA. Um, you know, typically uh, we, we're going to have a lot more flexibility on our side with the human-driven shuttles, um, but intense bad weather is always a, a concern. Um, but we rarely have times where um, you know we're, we're not providing any service, only during major blizzards and things like that. Um, but with the self-driven shuttle, yeah, I mean that it's part of testing some of those components out and seeing what level of, of weather um, is acceptable for those shuttles to operate. So part of phase two is to hopefully test some of those um, and see if those concerns are valid and how we mitigate those concerns as well. But we will be operating both services simultaneously. So even if the um, self-driven shuttle wasn't able to operate, we would probably, you know, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that the human-driven shuttle would be. So we'd be able to still provide that service in the community. That's great. Thank you, Rob, for addressing that question. I think we have one final question before we end today's session. But before we do that, I did want to encourage all of our participants to stay connected with the ITS for Us program and particularly the NFTA uh, sites project. So on this slide, you will find contact information for Alina Slotchenko with the ITS Joint Program Office and who is also the ITS for Us Program Manager. Uh, information for or contact information for Robert Jones, who you heard from earlier today, uh, who is the concept deployment lead, and as well as Kelly Dixon, who is the project management lead um, for the trip deployment. So we also have information here, a couple of links to the ITS for Us Deployment Program website and a link to a FAQ document, which might be helpful to those who may not uh, be as familiar with the deployment program, the ITS for Us Deployment Program or the NFTA uh, deployment site. I also wanted to encourage everyone to visit uh, this website that you see on your screen where you can learn more information about the Buffalo All Access uh, Project. So our final question that we received asks, how can I be invited to participate in the release demos? Yeah, this is, this is Jamie. Um, so the website on the screen is the best place to go and learn more about when we're doing those release demos but we also have a stakeholder email list um, so we send out um, information about those release demos uh, for registration purposes um, when we're doing them 
If you're not on that stakeholder email list, feel free to reach out to us uh, to get on that list. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, and as Jamie mentioned, we certainly encourage everyone to uh, visit the website that you'll find on your screen currently. This was mentioned earlier during the webinar, but today's session was recorded. So a recording, a copy of the recording along with the presentation will be posted to the ITS for Us Deployment Program website in the near future. And we will be sending out a notification to everyone who registered for today's webinar to inform you when those materials have been posted. So a big thank you to all of our participants for taking the time to join us today, uh, as well as to the USDOT and the NFTA team for a very informative presentation. Uh, we appreciate all of your engagement and participation throughout today's session, and we hope to see you back online in April for the next delivery here in the NFTA's uh, webinar series. So thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoy the rest of your week and appreciate your time as always.